Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Andrew Gronwald, professional engineer. He's an associate professor with the School for the Environment and Sustainability at the University of Michigan. He also holds adjunct, adjunct faculty appointments in the University of Michigan's Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering and the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences. Dr. Grunwald conducts research through a range of hydrological science projects that explore methods for quantifying and communicating uncertainties arising with long-term hydrological monitoring networks and data, and incorporating those uncertainties into models and risk-based water resource management decisions. Much of his recent research is focused on monitoring analyzing and forecasting the long-term water budget and water levels of the Laurentian Great Lakes. Drew? John, thanks for the introduction, and thanks everyone for being here. It's a, it's a real pleasure and an honor to uh, um, be invited by Save the River and to uh, be here with all of you this evening. So I, want to start, I wanted to start out tonight with what I thought was a pretty compelling image of what's going on across the Lake Ontario Basin to set the stage for a broader discussion about what is driving water levels across not just Lake Ontario and the St. Lawrence River, but the entire Great Lakes system. So this satellite image here that I got off the internet from NASA is showing, as we can see, the boundary of Lake Ontario. We're over here. But there's a range of processes going on here from a hydrology perspective, from a meteorology perspective, and from a climate perspective that influence water levels, including how much snow is accumulating on the landscape and when it melts. We're also seeing clouds and ultimately water vapor leaving the lake in the form of evaporation, and some of that will turn into lake effect snow and go back on the landscape. So just within the near domain of Lake Ontario, there are awful lot of things going on. But a big theme of this talk is to look beyond Lake Ontario to see what's happening upstream and downstream and even across the entire continent. So if we start taking a look at Lake Ontario and putting it into context within the entire Great Lakes Basin, we might get an image like this one. So what we have here is Lake Ontario. And then this area that I'm outlining right here is the formal definition of Lake Ontario's watershed, okay? That's where Lake Ontario gets its snowmelt, rainfall accumulation, but what's critical to see as part of the story here in terms of Lake Ontario's water levels is that Lake Ontario has another big watershed, and it's this entire area here. That's the area of the watershed of all the upper Great Lakes and they contribute all the flow that comes into Lake Ontario through the Niagara River. So ultimately, changes in the pattern of snowfall north of Lake Superior, changes in how land is used in Michigan, all ultimately affect the amount and the quality and the rate of flow that comes into Lake Ontario through here. But Lake Ontario is ultimately sandwiched with another big basin. So if you look downstream, we can see here a huge continental basin, the Ottawa River Basin, and as many of you know, the flow rate coming into uh, uh, Montreal through the Ottawa River can have a dramatic impact on how much water is allowed to leave Lake Ontario through Plan 2014. So if we want to understand water levels on Lake Ontario, we need to understand what's driving the water balance, which we'll talk about in a minute, throughout the entire system. Now, this is not a trivial problem. <laughs> the Great Lakes Basin is enormous. So I like to show this image sometimes to put things in perspective in the United States. So this red area right here includes essentially the upper Great Lakes St. Lawrence River Basin. And then these are other major river basins that we often get a lot of attention, the Colorado, the Columbia, and different portions of the Mississippi. We can even put this into a global perspective. When we look at the 20 largest freshwater basins on Earth, the Great Lakes Basin is included in those. So some other big names in here, the Amazon, Congo, and other major river basins. 
The Great Lakes St. Lawrence is right in there in terms of a major freshwater basin. So a take home message from this slide is that understanding and forecasting how water comes into these basins and leaves it is really a major challenge on a global scale. If we broaden a little bit though, just to the basin scale here, I'll show another satellite image, very similar to the one I showed earlier. So here's a satellite image of the entire Great Lakes Basin. Here's Lake Ontario, here's Lake Erie, Lake Huron is hidden here by clouds, here's Green Bay and Lake Michigan, then of course, Lake Superior. So again, this image is intended to underscore the range of processes that are going on across the entire basin, not just within the Lake Ontario Basin, but everywhere in terms of snow accumulation, rainfall, and evaporation, and we'll talk about those more in a minute. Now, the final point I want to make is if we're thinking about things on a global scale or a continental scale, there's two sort of take-homes that I'd, I'd like you to leave with. When we think about meteorology and climate, we often start off with thinking about changes in temperature and changes in precipitation. And one of the important things for the Great Lakes, including Lake Ontario, is that most of the moisture that comes into Lake Ontario comes from somewhere else outside of the basin. And I thought a great example of this that underscores or emphasizes not just the fact that this moisture comes from outside of the basin, but that it's also really hard to predict is Hurricane Ida. So what we're seeing here is a satellite image from September 1st, and this is a satellite image of all of the clouds and moisture coming up from the Gulf of Mexico as Hurricane Ida started to break apart. Now, if you take a look at this image and you ask somebody to forecast or predict where those clouds and where that moisture is going to go, and more importantly, whether or not it's going to enter Lake Ontario in the St. Lawrence River Basin, you've got a complicated problem on your hands, but that's part of the challenge of forecasting water levels across the system. Let me take this image and put it into a slightly different lens where instead of looking at a satellite image, we're gonna look at the total amount of precipitation or rainfall that accumulated across the region in early September. So that's what this plot is. This comes from NOAA, from the National Center for Environmental Prediction. And what we're looking at here the title of this is Accumulated Precipitation Anomaly. This sort of represents how far above or below the amount of rainfall that accumulated from September 1st to September 7th, how far it was either above or below the average that usually accumulates over that time period. So if you can see this scale bar on the bottom here, really, really, really dark green colors mean that 200 to 400 millimeters above average fell during that time period, whereas if you see lighter colors, it's on this end of the scale bar. And what I want to point out here is that many of us know that New York, New Jersey, Philadelphia got absolutely creamed with precipitation during that time period. But what I want you to notice is look how close that band of extraordinary precipitation was to the boundary of the Great Lakes Basin, right on the edge. If that system had moved just 50 miles to the north. On a, on a continental scale, that's nothing. But if it had moved just 50 miles north, we would have had a very different water level situation here over the past several weeks. So I want to leave you with this part as part of my overview in terms of just how complicated it is to anticipate what's going to happen with water levels in this system and the range of forces and where the moisture is coming from that influence the basin. Now, I've been talking here about precipitation primarily. But remember I said there were two things that we tend to track when it comes to meteorology and climate, precipitation and temperature. So anyone want to take a guess at what this is an image of? You can say it out loud if you feel like saying it out loud. Part, partially the jet stream, yep. So what this image is from a paper that was recently published uh, in the Journal of Atmospheric Sciences, this represents a field of research that's growing to model the Arctic polar vortex deformation. So you guys remember many times in the media over the past several years, we've heard this term, the polar vortex. Well, this is a three-dimensional mass of really, 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 really cold air. And it's usually contained by the jet stream, 
when the jet stream rotates around here and is relatively stable, that air mass stays pretty contained. But ironically, what scientists think is happening is that as the Earth is warming, it's changing the stability of this air mass so that every few years, every four years, the air mass can wobble, and as a consequence, huge chunks of cold Arctic air can descend upon different parts of the Northern Hemisphere, just like they've done recently across the Great Lakes. So we can have big fluxes of moisture and rain coming from the Gulf of Mexico or the Atlantic Ocean. They might hit the Great Lakes, they might not. We can have big masses of cold Arctic air that stop or slow down evaporation in the Great Lakes, and those can happen every two to three years, but almost impossible to predict. So with that, I'm done, and we can go on. I'm just kidding, John. We're not. So I wanted to give you those slides to give you some broad context, but now let's dive into some of the details here. Um, so the title of my talk tonight is The Ups and Downs of Great Lakes Water Levels, and I want to dive a little bit more into what exactly makes up the Great Lakes water balance and what changes we've seen in the water balance components over time. So I want to start off with just a little bit more of an introduction into the Great Lakes and their magnitude. Then I want to stop, talk about um, historical Great Lakes water levels, so we all have an understanding of how water levels have been changing over time. Third, I want to talk about what exactly the major components of the Great Lakes water balance are. Uh, and then I want to make a brief note about, um, new, about computer models that are used to predict weather and climate and, and the whole overall topic of forecasting, and then leave you with just a few final thoughts here. Um, so to begin with, I would be remiss if I didn't thank you all again for being here, but also to thank uh, my team at the University of Michigan. I'm very, very fortunate to have a group of postdoctorate fellows and graduate students and a cohort of undergraduate students who work in my group. And the data that you're going to see and the plots and the analysis would not be possible without their contribution. Um, I also want to thank many of my colleagues. Uh, I worked for the National Oceanic and Atmos Atmospheric Administration for many years. And this slide shows many of my colleagues there. They're really outstanding scientists who do incredible, what I would call foundational work. They do it year after year. Uh, that's readily available to the public, and I need to pay uh, tribute to their contribution to this as well. Uh, and finally, several of the organizations that fund my group's research, including the Army Corps of Engineers, United States Geological Survey, the Great Lakes Protection Fund, Michigan Department of Transportation, and the Council of Great Lakes Governors and Premiers. So we talked a little bit about the magnitude of the Great Lakes, and I want to show this slide to really quantify that. What this table is showing is a summary of the largest lakes on Earth ranked by surface area. So on the left-hand side here, we have the name of those large lakes. The second column is the country or the countries in which those lakes reside. Here we have surface area and volume. And I've highlighted the Great Lakes to put things into perspective. And some of you who have seen me talk before know some of the ways we try to present this. Here's the latest angle we take on the Great Lakes story there are about 100 million lakes all across the Earth. And those lakes essentially are our surface water storage. Rivers are relatively transient. So if you just look at like the volume of water that's in lakes and rivers, the reality is that lakes hold the majority of the volume of water, which makes sense, right? So 100 million lakes on Earth, these 10 lakes hold 80% of all of that water. So let me just phrase that differently. 80% of all of the Earth's fresh, unfrozen surface water is in its 10 largest lakes. So we've sort of embraced that perspective as motivation for why we want to understand the amount of water that comes into and leaves the Great Lakes, um, not just uh, here in North America, but in other continents as well. So let's take a look at water level dynamics over the past several years so we can have some context for understanding the water balance. So we're very fortunate in the Great Lakes to have a series of water level monitoring stations. Um, on the U.S. side, they're maintained by NOAA, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration. On the Canadian side, they're maintained by the Canadian Hydrographic Service. And they look like this. There are these housing stations that have all types of cool instrument on them for measuring wind, for measuring humidity, air temperature. They transmit the information with an antenna. 
but not visible inside of this housing is a sump, is a well with a water level sensor inside. This one happens to be located on, in Mackinac City. If we draw a map of the location of all these water level gauging stations, we are spoiled. So a lot of the large lakes around the world that we study have no gauges or maybe one gauge and they have to use satellite imagery to understand water level changes. Here on the Great Lakes, we have about 80 water level gauging stations around the Great Lakes. Um, the blue ones that you see here are owned and maintained by United States federal agencies, primarily NOAA. On the Canadian side, primarily owned, the red ones are primarily owned and maintained by the Canadian federal government. Um, you can see here, interestingly, I'll throw this in, the box right here with the X, those gauges that you see here, 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 and here, those are what we call master gauges. They have been in place on the lakes since 1860, recording continuously. There really isn't any other freshwater system on Earth that I would argue has such a long and continuous record of the hydrologic system as we have here in the Great Lakes. So if we put that data together, we end up with a water level record that looks like this one. Now I know it's a lot of information, but let's walk through it just a little bit so you can see what we have here. Down here along the bottom, I'm showing you the year. So we start over here at 1860, and we go all the way up to present. One of my students just updated this before I came here, so this is brand new. Um, on the top row here, we have Lake Superior, along with its water levels here. Um, these are referenced to the International Great, Lake Datum, Great Lakes Datum of 1985. Lake Michigan and Lake Huron, often combined as one lake, Lake Erie, and then here, of course, Lake Ontario. So a lot of interesting stories in here. Um, we could spend several beers and a lot of hours looking at all the ups and downs, but the big message, the big message for this talk um, focuses a lot on the past 20 years, where in particular, if you're looking at the entire system, Lake Superior, Lake Michigan, Huron, and Lake Erie went through a period of incredible, what I will call, lack of variability the water levels were incredibly stagnant. And in Lake Michigan and Lake Huron, you'll notice that they were consistently below average. Does everybody see that time period right there? The narrative across the upper Great Lakes during that period was that climate change is happening, temperatures are going up, and North America will be faced with a future of aridity and drought. And this was a mistake. For a lot of the country, that is the future that is down the road. But for the Great Lakes, it is not. And that was manifest starting in 2014 when water levels went on a record-setting surge across the entire Great Lakes. You can see it here in the upper Great Lakes. And of course, in 2017 and 2019, Lake Ontario hit record highs. Just an extraordinary event. We'll talk a little bit later about what's been happening if you can squint really, really hard. Um, and you know, I didn't even tell you what these dots are. I'm so sorry. The light blue dots are monthly average water levels, and the dark blue dots are annual average water levels. And then the red line that you see across here is the long-term average water level over this entire period. So if you squint really hard, you can see these blue dots right here, the last sort of the current annual average for each of the lakes, a little bit of a crash going on in terms of water levels across the entire Great Lakes system, not just here. We can zoom in a little bit closer. This is a, a plot of the exact same data that I took, but we just zoom in. So the time period here goes instead from 1990 up until 2020, but the same setup here where the top row is Lake Superior, the next row is Lake Michigan Huron, the next row here is Lake Erie, and then down here is Lake Ontario. And all this does is allows us to take a little bit of a closer look at what happened over the past 20 to 30 years or so. Here, if you can see my pointer, are the peaks on Lake Ontario in 2017 and 2019. Here you can see this tremendous rise in water level on Lake Superior. Here a more gradual but still profound in rise on Lake Michigan-Huron and a rise on Lake Erie as well. We'll get back to this in a little bit. So one of the reasons we study water levels and do a lot of research is to combat images like this one. When water levels were low, this image was created in one of the Michigan news outlets called M Live, which was, uh, it came out in around 2012, 2013 when water levels were low. 
And for those of you who can't quite make out what this is, here's, the, um, here's Lake Michigan, the northern part of Lake Michigan, and then the artist who did this has replaced Lake Huron with a big drain, uh, basically implying that water levels have gone down, but maybe we're not entirely sure why. It could be, it could be historical dredging operations, perhaps it's uh, drinking water supplies, so we take this on as a challenge to make sure that we can account for all the water that comes into and leaves the Great Lakes Basin. Um, when water levels rose, um, some of our work appeared on the cover of this magazine, EOS, but it was in contrast to this water level decline. This is an image you might have seen before of water levels crashing over the uh, sort of iconic bike path in the city of Chicago. So two very different stories going on. Let's take a look at what's been happening with what we call the water balance over this time period. And so to be really succinct, the water balance is a reflection of the amount of water coming into and leaving the Great Lakes Basin. Let's walk through what the water balance is for the Great Lakes so we have it down pat. It makes sense when we're looking at the water balance to break the Great Lakes up into individual watersheds. So here's Lake Superior and its watershed and the watershed for each of the other Great Lakes. I will, for the next few minutes, be combining Lake Michigan and Lake Huron into one big system. So what I have here is, I don't have all of my data on here yet, I'm gonna walk you through it. But on the left-hand side, what I'm gonna show you are what we call the three major water balance components within each of the lakes. And those are first and foremost, runoff, which I'm gonna show in a minute in green bars. That's all the water that comes into a lake from within its watershed, not from the big river coming in or the big river leaving, but just the rivers and streams that come into the watershed. The next major water balance component that I'm gonna show here in blue is over lake precipitation. That's the amount of rain that falls directly on the surface of a lake. And I'm just gonna pause for a second to point out that there aren't many freshwater systems in the world where you have to account for the water that falls directly on the water surface. The Congo River doesn't have to worry about that. The Amazon River doesn't have to worry about that. Most of their water comes in over land into the river. But in the Great Lakes, we have to account for water that falls onto the lake. Third and finally, we have to account for water that is lost through evaporation off the lake surface. So those, if anybody asks you, what are the three major components of the water balance? Runoff, precipitation on the lake, and evaporation from the lake. Over on this side, I'm gonna show you two other water balance components that we have to add into that. One that I'm gonna show in green bars is the rate of water flow between each of the lakes. And I'm also gonna show you water that is diverted either into or out of the Great Lakes Basin. Now there are actually quite a few diversions of water into and out of the entire Great Lakes Basin, but there's two I won't say major ones because they're not as big as we'll see in a moment, but two that are pretty well known. So let's walk through this here. So let's start with Lake Superior. So these bars right here, this green bar and blue bar and pink bar, represent the relative magnitudes of runoff, over lake precipitation, and over lake evaporation for Lake Superior. If you're interested, these numbers refer to, we convert this into a, a flow rate as if it's a long-term flow so that we can easily compare it to the flow of the rivers between the lakes, okay? So this number right here, uh, the 2.0, means that the amount of water coming into Lake Superior through over lake precipitation is like a river flowing at a rate of around 2,000 cubic meters per second. Make sense? Okay. So let's use that as a basis for a comparison. That's what's happening with the water balance in Lake Superior. We can jump over here. This is the amount of water on average that leaves Lake Superior. So the flow in the St. Mary's River is about 2,200 cubic meters per second. We can go down to the next lake system. Oh, whoops, sorry. I mentioned I'd added a diversion here. A lot of people don't know that there is a diversion of water into the Great Lakes system. It's called the Ugoki and the Long Lake Diversion. We can talk about it more later if people have questions. But it's actually a diversion of water into the Great Lakes system from the Hudson Bay watershed in Canada. If we go to the next system, Lake Michigan and Lake Huron, here are its water balance components. You can see the green bar for runoff, the blue bar for precipitation on the lake surface, and the pink for evaporation. I want to pause here for a moment and mention again, 
it is absolutely extraordinary that more water comes into Lake Superior and Lake Michigan and Huron through water on the lake than into the lake through rivers and streams. Okay, and that's just a reflection of how big the lake surfaces are. We can jump over to this side and see what the rate of flow is that goes out of Lake Michigan and Lake Huron. We're up to about 5,500 cubic meters per second. I've also added in here the numbers for Lake St. Clair, not a really big um, player in the water balance at this scale. I've also added in here, many of you know about the Chicago diversion, the diversion of water out that was originally set up to help improve water quality conditions in Southern Lake Michigan. Interesting take home point, if you're ever at a cocktail hour and somebody asks you, hey, does Chicago have a big impact on the water balance? You can say, A, not really relative to these other components, but actually I learned something. More water comes into the Great Lakes through this diversion than leaves through Chicago. So we actually have a net gain of water through these two major diversions across the entire system. And then I'll f finish off here. Here's the water balance for Lake Erie. As we go down through the system, about 6,300 cubic meters per second on average leave um, Lake Erie and come into Lake Ontario. And here we're starting to see that cumulative effect of how changes in these components upstream of Lake Ontario can have a major impact on this number right here, the amount of water that comes into the St. Lawrence River, or excuse me, into Lake Ontario. And then the final step of this is let's look at the internal water balance of Lake Ontario. So here is the amount of water balance components of runoff, precipitation, evaporation that enter Lake Ontario just from its basin. And here I'll add in the amount of water that flows out. Whoops. The amount of water that flows out through the St. Lawrence River. So that by the time we get down to the St. Lawrence and Lake Ontario, the big players in the water balance are the major upstream watershed, in other words, the Niagara River and everything upstream, and the outflow from the lake. Okay. Um, one final point I wanted to make. When we look at this number right here, and I'm guessing a lot of you in this room are familiar with this, but a lot of people in the Great Lakes aren't. So I'm going to show this slide. This number right here, 7,000 cubic meters per second, that is, an <laughs> that is an extraordinary amount of water. Okay, We call this a continental scale flow. And it, you know, it was only recently that some of the students in our group were like, how does that compare with some of the biggest rivers in North America? Um, and we ranked it in a paper we wrote recently. So by the time the St. Lawrence gets close to the Gulf of St. Lawrence, it is the second highest discharge of water off the North American continent, not just in the United States, but off, the, off all of North America. So the first is the Mississippi River here. So this is showing the largest rivers in all of North America. The Mississippi has an annual average flow of about 18,000 cubic meters per second. Second, St. Lawrence River at about 11,000 cubic meters per second. And then the Mackenzie. I've stumped pretty much everybody in my family and close friends and relatives on this one. They cannot believe that the St. Lawrence River has more flow than the Columbia River, but it absolutely does. Um, and then we have the Yukon, Fraser, Nelson, and Coxsowoc rivers in Canada. So just an extraordinary amount of water flowing through the system. Okay. Now that we have a good understanding of what these major water balance components are, right? Precipitation, runoff, evaporation. Let's take a look at how they've changed over the past 60 years and how they relate to the water level changes that we've seen. So you haven't missed anything. There's no data on this, on this screen yet. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you and unfold it here a little bit slowly. In this graph right here, I want to show you from 1950 until about 2019 how unusual precipitation over the Great Lakes has been in terms of an anomaly, that word right here. In this graph, in this middle plot, I'm going to show you how unusual lake evaporation has been. Has it been above average or below average and by how much? And then finally, this term right here, my thumbs aren't small enough, they keep hitting the other one. This term right here is what I'm calling net lake moisture flux. So what I'm doing is I'm taking the amount of water that comes onto a lake through precipitation, and then I'm subtracting the amount of water lost from evaporation. So in other words, what's the net amount of water that came onto the lake? If precipitation and evaporation are unequal, the net amount of water 
is zero. If precipitation is a lot more, the net amount of water is positive. Make sense? Okay, let's take a look at what's been happening since 1950. So, the blue bars that you see are years where precipitation across the Great Lakes has been above average and the orange bars below average. And this black line is sort of like a 10-year rolling average to give us an idea of some sort of trend over that time period. And so what we see is precipitation. Many of you who, who have either witnessed it or know about the low water levels in the 1960s, um, precipitation not changing too much through here, and then this rise from the mid-1900s until, and I'm stopping this plot intentionally right around 2013. And the reason I'm doing that is, remember, one part of this story is that in 2013, most people were saying the future of the Great Lakes is declining water levels. Everything's about aridity and drought, and that's the future. So I'm stopping this time series intentionally right here for the minute, for a moment, so you can just compare up until 2013. So that's the lake precipitation story up until then. Here's the lake evaporation story. So a little bit more variability than people might have expected, but this period right here of consistent above average evaporation starts right at 1998 and was really a big driver with those low water levels I showed you earlier. So remember I showed you Lake Superior, Lake Michigan and Huron had persistent below average water levels. That coincides with this time period right here. And if over, and that stops, this graph stops right at around 2014. If we add those together, we get sort of the net amount of water over the lakes. And aside from this time period right here where we have a low net amount of water, there's nothing too profound. A little bit above, a little bit above, a little bit below, but nothing too dramatic. What I wanna do next is add in the water balance components for the period from 2014 to 2020 to contrast with what we see here. You ready? First, let's take a look at what happened with lake precipitation from 2014 through 2020. Seven years of off the charts precipitation. By every account, it was the wettest decade in recorded history for Central North America. Where did that moisture come from? A lot of it came from Seattle, okay? A lot of it came from the Gulf of Mexico, and a lot of it came from the Atlantic Ocean. It was not easy to predict, but it is consistent with long-term climate projections that the amount of moisture coming to the Great Lakes region is likely to continue going up and up. Next, let's look at lake evaporation. What was that phenomenon that we talked about earlier that happened first in 2014 that was in the news? The polar vortex. Cold Arctic air descended across the Great Lakes. The lakes froze, the lake temperatures went down and evaporation slowed down. Here's the next few years. You might not be able to see it too clearly, but I have a gray background. Almost all of these years are below average evaporation. So what happens if we add together really, really high above average precipitation with below average water loss through evaporation? We get a net amount of water across the Great Lakes that is a little bit unprecedented in our record right here. So that's what I'm taught with these green bars right here. These are sort of the summation of this amount of precipitation minus this evaporation, which is pretty low. And we end up with a really good explanation for why water level surged during that time period. So that is a look at what the water balance going back to 1950, but what I wanna finish off with is make things a little bit more contemporary because I know that from October of 2020 through this summer, there was an awful lot of concern in Lake Ontario and across the entire Great Lakes about where the water go. I mean, we were just concerned with record high water levels over the past few years and then water levels plummeted Later on when we do Q&A, we can talk a little bit more about Plan 2014, but right now I want to talk about the water balance and in particular changes in precipitation. So here's this entire time period. This sliver right here from October 2020 up until late spring, early summer is where I want to focus. And I want to show you something here to put things into perspective. This top plot right here is Lake Superior. So you can look at the monthly water levels on Lake Superior. You can see the decline here going back to average and then the spring rise. I want to point out to you, Lake Michigan and Lake Huron 
declining a lot here in the fall from October into the winter. But do you see this flat period right here on Lake Michigan Huron? Can you guys all see that? I asked my students, I said, can you take a look and see the last time that Lake Michigan Huron had a flat period in the spring? Never. For the first time in recorded history, Lake Michigan Huron did not have a spring rise. There was not enough snowpack, there wasn't much precipitation, and usually that spring rise, it just didn't happen, okay? And of course, on Lake Ontario here, we had this sort of odd cycling events where it took until July, right, for water levels to start coming up a little bit. So let's take a closer look at what happened here. So I'm gonna go back to November of 2020 and take a look at the national precipitation picture. So what this map is showing, this also comes from NOAA, from NCEP, the National Center for Environmental Prediction. And this is a little bit of different plot than what I showed you earlier. These are rankings. So if you took every single year or every month of precipitation in the historical record and ranked them and then compared this month with the historical record, that's what these numbers reflect. So sort of like a ranking in terms of percentiles. So what I want you to look at here is let's look at the Great Lakes Basin and just try to get a feel for whether or not precipitation across the basin as we scroll through these months was generally in the high percentiles, like wet, like up here, 80th, 70th. If it's white, that means it's about average. Or if it's orange, red, and that means the precipitation was below average. So here we go. November of 2020, about average, maybe a little dry in Lake Ontario. December 2020, not good, okay? Extraordinarily dry uh, in northern parts of Michigan, Lake Superior, Wisconsin, like extraordinarily, meaning this dark part right here, meaning the lowest amount of precipitation ever recorded in, in a December on record. Let's go to January of 2021, pretty dry. Every single area of the Great Lakes on this map is either in the 10th percentile or below or in terms of precipitation. February, about average, except along the southern shoreline of Lake Erie and eastern Lake Ontario, very dry. March, a little bit of above average precipitation here, but mostly dry. April, some wet, some dry, and then extraordinarily dry in May. So what we have here, if you did the calculus on this or did the math to figure out what's the probability that you'd have this sequence of pretty dry, dry, very dry, moderately dry sequences, it's extraordinarily unlikely. This was essentially a mini drought throughout the Great Lakes from October through May and is really the best ex explanation we have for why water levels declined across the entire Great Lakes system, where I live in particular with concerns over Lake Michigan and Lake Huron. So I want to make just a few final points about models and forecasting here before I wrap up. Um, I, I want to underscore this point again about forecasting the water balance and water levels across the Great Lakes depends entirely on our ability to predict these air masses, okay? So these are the major air masses that dominate the movement of moisture and temperature across North America. So for example, two, two of them right here are the continental Arctic air mass and the continental polar mass. Very, very cold, very, very dry. If those dominate our weather patterns, it's obvious that it's gonna be cold, evaporation is probably gonna go down, and we're not gonna get a lot of moisture. But in contrast, when we have these hurricanes come through, they tend to carry this maritime tropical air, warm and a lot of moisture. So the take home message from this slide is that at any given point, given the location and the magnitude of the jet stream uh, and other factors, one or more of these air masses might be dominating our weather and our, and our climate. So I wanna finish off with this slide to give you an idea of what forecasting looks like at this scale. This is actually a, a tool that one of my postdoctorate fellows, Becky Bollinger is her name, she's now the assistant climate director for the state of Colorado. But when she was in the Great Lakes, I compelled her to focus just a little bit on, on the Great Lakes system, and she developed a climate forecasting tool. And so what it does, first off, is you can pick any lake basin you want, and you can pick any time period, and you can look first at what the historical 
patterns are for either precipitation or temperature. So what this plot is showing, it's, it's not clear on here, but this is the Lake Ontario Basin, okay? And we've asked this tool to show us October, November, December of 2020, and January, February, March of 2021. And all that's shown here is a band. This y-axis here is precipitation. All we're seeing here is a band showing the range of historical data for each one of those months. So if you looked at every single October in Lake Ontario's history, it would range, the precipitation would range from anywhere from 20 millimeters all the way up to 220. But the red is sort of this above normal range, the gray is about average, and the blue is below. This differentiation between above average and below average is what NOAA and the National Weather Service use when they make forecasts. Okay, but again, this is just a reflection of historical data. So, the question is, when NOAA goes and runs its numerical models on a big computer, or big agencies in Europe, or Canada, or China run computer models over the Earth, and we use them for predictions, do they give us any better information than this? If the answer is yes, then we have a shot at forecasting what water levels are gonna be. But if the answer is no, it's gonna be pretty hard to forecast water levels because we can't get the major component of the water balance here. So let's take a look in what I'm gonna call a box and whisper plot. I haven't shown it yet, but it's basically gonna have a box in the middle and then two long arms. They're gonna show the approximate range of all of the computer models that were generated for each one of these months. You ready? There they are. These boxes right here are what we call an interquartile range. They show about the sort of 50%, inner 50% of all the models. And then these whiskers out here show the full range of all the models. And some of these circles show individual models that were way out there. If you looked at the, this box and whisker plot and compared it to the historical record, do you think you'd have any basis for saying whether precipitation is going to be profoundly above or below average during this time period? Not a chance, okay? People have done extraordinary studies to go back and look at every single one of these models with the hope that maybe in February it works, maybe in April this model works, and nobody has found a pattern where there's a particular model that does a particularly good job of forecasting precipitation over an area as large as Lake Ontario due to influences of things like the jet stream, due to movement of these large continental air masses. It's just a really hard problem to solve. Last thing I wanna leave you with here is if you're looking way, way, way into the future, one thing that is certain is that over long, long, long time periods across the Great Lakes, Temperature is going up on average, and precipitation is going up. We've already seen it happen, and what I'm showing you here is a summary of long-term computer models that are showing a signal. What we're seeing here on this screen, and I'll just sort of walk you through the legend here, these dots all represent individual computer models that are reflecting the future of the Great Lakes. On this axis right here, we're looking at the increase in air temperature that each one of those models is showing. And on this axis, we're showing the increase in precipitation that the model is showing. Almost every single one of these dots represents a model that's showing some degree of temperature increase across the Great Lakes Basin over the next 50 years and some degree of precipitation increase. So what happens if we have a system where precipitation is going up over time, and temperature is going up over time. We can talk about that later, but the way we're thinking about this is we're viewing this as like a tug of war between two strong forces. Imagine an elementary school playground where you have two teams that are getting stronger and stronger over time. The flag in the middle of the tug of war might stay the same sometimes, but if one team lets go a little bit after the teams have gotten stronger, what happens to that flag? It'll swing really fast in one direction or the other direction. We've seen here that precipitation is going up over time and evaporation has a tendency to get stronger over time. So anytime one of them changes, 
there's an increased chance that water levels are going to swing and probably swing more dramatically. So my final thoughts here. Three take-home points, the same one I started off with. The Great Lakes really are this massive, complex hydrologic system, and that the air masses that change the temperature of our region and bring moisture to it are moving around the continent at this major scale, and all of that is really hard to predict, making it a big challenge to forecast water levels at a seasonal scale. I did a lot of reading during COVID, and I stumbled upon some books that I've read in the past, and there's four books that I'm going to recommend if you're interested in reading more about um, the future of water across this country. A lot of you have probably read The Cadillac Desert. It's a classic about water in the West by Mark Reisner. The second book is a colleague of mine at Duke University named Martin Doyle. It has a lot in there about the Erie Canal and the St. Lawrence Seaway. It's called The Source subtitled How Rivers Made America and How America Remade Its Rivers. Just an awesome perspective on how this country evolved in concert with shipping and the Army Corps of Engineers. Third book, I'm guessing I got thumbs up, Dan Egan, um, The Death and Life of the Great Lakes. Dan Egan, if you guys didn't see it, wrote an article for the New York Times several weeks ago that was the front page Sunday New York Times article about Lake Michigan and Chicago. And if you haven't had a chance to read it or see it online, it was off the charts. The graphics, and in particular, the story about the connection between Lake Michigan and the Mississippi River Basin, right there at the locks in Chicago, is just fascinating. So Dan is doing some great work. And then finally, many of, many of us have already talked about this today, The Great Lakes Water Wars by Peter Annan. So, um, Folks, thank you so much for listening. Thanks to those who um, helped secure the venue here at the Clayton Opera House, and of course, Everyone from Save the River, thank you guys so much for hanging out and for, and for talking. And in particular, um, Lindsay, thanks for helping coordinate a lot up until this point. John, thank you. And Rick, thanks very much. Thanks for the sponsors. And I'll leave you with this image as we shift over to Q&A. So thanks again. Thank you very much, Drew. As we start our Q&A session, I want to introduce two friends and colleagues of mine who have come up tonight to try to answer any questions you may have. The first is Jim Howe. Jim is the director of the Nature Conservancy's Central and Western New York chapter, where he leads a team of more than 20 staff working to conserve the lands and waters of a region that includes Lake Erie and Lake Ontario the Southern Tier, the Finger Lakes, and the Tug Hill. The Nature Conservancy protects and restores land and water and seeks to transform the way the world meets its needs for food, energy, and water. Jim is one of 18 people appointed by the IJC to the public advisory group that is undertaking a review of Plan 2014's performance during high water conditions. Before joining the Nature Conservancy, Jim worked at the Sonoran Institute in Tucson, Arizona, and as a journalist covering state and federal environmental and land use policy in Washington, D.C. He is co-author of the book, Balancing Nature and Commerce in Gateway Communities, a how-to guide designed to help communities preserve their quality of life in the face of growth and development pressures. Jim's a graduate of Cornell University's Department of Natural Resources and holds a master's degree in public policy from the University of Michigan. So this is Jim Howe. Thank you, John. Nice <clears throat> Another person that doesn't need much introduction to any of you in the room is Tom Brown. Tom's professional background is in the field of environmental sciences. He was a former captain in the United States Army. He holds a graduate degree in environmental science from the College of Environmental Science and Forestry at Syracuse University, where he served for a number of years as adjunct professor. He is currently a career retired regional director with New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. During his extended career with New York State, he represented the state on a number of Great Lakes interstate boards and commissions, including the IJC's Lake Ontario-St. Lawrence River Board, 
where he continues to serve as one of the six binational voting board members. In his earlier role with the IJC, Mr. Brown was one of the drafters of the plan of study leading to the completion of the current revised Lake Ontario St. Lawrence Regulation Plan 2014. A considerable component of Mr. Brown's research and environmental studies, including field work concentrated in the area of coastal wetlands productivity and preservation. Tom, I know you've got a couple of comments to make before we start the Q&A. Thank you, John. <clears throat> Good evening, and it's a pleasure to be here uh, with you uh, once again. And uh, before I uh, sit down to uh, work with uh, my colleagues over here on questions and answers, there are a couple of remarks that I wanted to make. Uh, I think my first one is, uh, uh, given my role with the uh, regulation board, uh, Drew, uh, uh, can you stick around for another two, couple years and accompany me on a lot of these public meetings? <laughs> I'd be lovely to have you with me. Uh, just a couple of points I want to start with, and uh, uh, I think that the questions and answers will uh, probably follow some of the points I want to make with you, but I want to make sure that before I left here this evening that I had a chance to uh, uh, just stress uh, two or three points that I think it's important that we all keep in mind. And the first point is the Great Lakes are too big and powerful to be controlled by any one limited outlet on the St. Lawrence River. The ability to control water levels within the natural system is in the realm of centimeters and inches for us, not meters and feet. Furthermore, there is no control in the amount of water coming into Lake Ontario from the upper Great Lakes. Therefore, future floods, as well as low water conditions, are inevitable. And we need to be better prepared for these events when they occur. And the last word that I would, uh, you've heard me talk about them in, in the past, but it's our coastal wetlands. And I would not want to leave here today without saying that the health and survival of the Great Lakes is dependent on the preservation of our coastal wetlands. And as of now, 60% of those coastal wetlands have already been lost. Wetlands are the most productive ecosystems on Earth and are important and are an important provision of the current regulation plan 2014. So with that, uh, thanks for sticking with me on those initial comments, and uh, I'd be glad to uh, try and answer any questions that you may have, question and answer. Thank you. Thank you, Tom, very much. So with that, we will open it up to the floor for any questions. Uh, you've got three people here that have more experience on the climate and the environment and the water regulations plan than anybody I know. So does anybody have any questions? I see one question right here. If you could give the gentleman the microphone. Thank you. So I want to run out and buy a palm tree. <laughs> Things are going to get wet and humid. <laughs> uh, what's the biggest driver for evaporation? So yeah, the question was, what's the biggest driver of evaporation? So um, the, the, there are several ways we can answer that, but the easiest one has to do with um, changes in the uh, humidity of the air, the water content of the air, and temperature and wind. So those are the three factors. Um, so typically what will cut drive evaporation is cold, dry air moving over relatively warm water, to put it really simply. So um, in the Great Lakes system, the biggest drivers of evaporation are the late fall, when the, the lakes still have a relatively large amount of heat, but the air is extraordinarily cold and dry. So um, that's sort of the simple version of the answer. Cold, dry air, relatively warm water are the big drivers, but um, there are a lot of other factors, including changes in ice cover, 
Um, but those are, that's the big, that's the simplest answer I can give you. Yeah, good evening. Uh, we heard a lot about the scientific issues surrounding uh, the water inflows and outflows for the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence Valley. There's, as we understand it and have been told today, there's very little control over that. Uh, it's Mother Nature and you don't mess with Mother Nature. But what we didn't hear about is the guy who raises and lowers the gates to control the outflows of the river. What are the political issues surrounding all of this? And who's the guy who says, lower the gates when the water level is low? Uh, which is, a, I understand is what happened. Um, there are things within our control, such as when the gates are open and when they're closed, um, that weren't discussed tonight. So can anyone address those issues? Again, I would hark back to the point I tried to make earlier that uh, um, the outflow control is extremely limited. Uh, and when uh, uh, releases or holdbacks are um, put in place, uh, they don't have much influence over uh, dramatic levels change. As I mentioned, uh, uh, we, we don't control and we have no capacity control to control to the level of uh, feet and meters. The best outlet uh, um, limit we have falls within uh, uh, really a few inches or centimeters. So the, the efforts to uh, raise and lower the lake uh, through the limited controls that are in place on the St. Lawrence is extremely limited and uh, will never come close to uh, moving enough water in a short period of time to satisfy public interest of having it uh, dramatically come up or down. It really is a, uh, a result of uh, the incapacity, the amount of water coming in, as I tried to say earlier, and the limited opportunity to get it out. On top of that, uh, um, you've heard Drew mention uh, uh, the huge uh, 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 volume of flow in the St. Lawrence River uh, way overtops what little changes we can make in it. So most of the time, uh, uh, our influence over any significant change is impossible when you have uh, drought conditions or you have uh, uh, extremely wet conditions. Uh, it's just an adequate uh, system to handle all that amount of water. And therefore, uh, the only answer to uh, uh, this from our view is that uh, we've got to accept the fact that uh, during wet periods or extremely dry periods, w the only solution we can look to is uh, uh, resiliency measures along the shorelines. And I think until everyone understands how limited the capacity for anybody to make a dramatic change to a water level on the lake or the river is extremely limited to uh, inches and centimeters. That's what it comes down to. So it's never going to be possible to uh, achieve the kind of dramatic changes many would like to see during drought conditions or flood conditions. And it's a question that uh, um, can only uh, be resolved by finding a way to make our shorelines more resilient to these highs and lows that are inevitable. That's the best answer I can give you. We just don't have the ability to move any significant uh, amounts of water up or down uh, when you have uh, extreme conditions of wet or dry. I'll pick up this mic. Yeah, I, I just, uh, you know, I think there's a there's a perception sometimes too. Can you all hear me with this? Yeah, um, that there is a person that's making these decisions on a daily basis. And actually, the new the new operating plan for the lake and river plan 2014 
operates by a series of algorithms, so it's a computer model. Only when the lake hits extreme levels, the lake and river hit extreme levels, high or low, does, does the board actually start to make decisions about what to do. And I also want to point out, you saw Drew's graphs today. I mean, if the IJC could have picked a worse time to adopt a new operating plan, I can't imagine when it would be. I mean, you saw the precipitation spiking. So of course, I think if you're living along the shoreline of the lake and river, you think there's a new plan, my property is flooding, but actually it's really, there's whatever plan was in place, we would have seen the same level of flooding. And what I've been told by the IJC is that under extreme conditions, pretty much any operating plan operates the same way. It's only when the lake is at an average level where, where the IJC and the board really can have an influence on whether the lake goes a little high or a little low. Um, yeah, you want to pick up some more? Okay. Yeah, it, that's, so, that's basically what I wanted to say is there really isn't someone opening and closing the gates of the, of the river that, that used to operate under the previous plan, but the IJC tried to make this more of a, a rational, um, computerized model program that really looks to optimize benefits for all the, the, the users on the lake and river, including the environment for the first time. We can talk more about that. Uh, just, uh, <coughs> Jim, one of the things you said about uh, uh, the benefits of uh, the plan that uh, lays out uh, uh, these uh, levels and flows uh, over, uh, over time periods. Uh, one of the examples would be right now, uh, we've, we've got a situation where there's a, uh, an inch and a half of uh, stored water on the lake that would uh, uh, normally be, uh, it's a deviation resulting from uh, uh, changes that were made to the water levels uh, through regulation in the spring when we were looking at a uh, much different situation of uh, projections of Lake Ontario levels. So right now, we decided the other day in a board meeting to uh, uh, actually hold that uh, uh, inch and a half deviation um, through to the second uh, uh, weekend in, in uh, in October for boat haul out. Uh, and uh, this is where the board can uh, uh, be beneficial to uh, water users, especially boaters, uh, because what this will allow us to do is keep the lake and, the, of course, the upper river, the lake includes the upper river, uh, above the uh, water control structure at uh, Moses Saunders. So what the board was able to do and is able to do right now at least hold a little bit more water on the lake and upper river uh, for the rest of the boating season. A couple of inches uh, may not sound a lot, but it is in some place cases uh, where people are looking at haul outs through to uh, uh, the latter part of the second week in, second weekend in October when uh, um, the uh, major haul out would occur on Lake St. Lawrence, for example, uh, and Lake St. Lawrence is much dramatically uh, um, affected more dramatically uh, than the upper river, but here, here's a benefit period that the regulation board uh, uh, can do or a benefit opportunity to give the recreational industry and uh, also people who need to haul boats at marinas and so forth a few more inches of water on the lake than they would normally have through our limited control. And I just want to point that out as an example that we can make some minor changes that can be helpful, but we cannot make dramatic changes that will uh, make a big difference in uh, a drought condition period or extreme wet condition or co flood condition. Thank you. We have a question over here. First of all, thank you for uh, educating and informing us tonight. And um, the comment was made about 60% of the wetlands, coastal wetlands being lost. So my question is, could you elaborate a little more on why they're important? And if that 60% is gone, is there any effort to preserve the 40% or is that, and in addition to that, is that 60% at all regainable or is it just lost? Thank you for that question. Uh, and uh, 
Let me go back to the former regulation plans, and that's how we uh, really got into trouble because uh, the right regulation plan, uh, 1958D, 1958DD, uh, did not include uh, considerations for coastal wetlands. And what we were seeing was uh, efforts uh, here on Lake Ontario uh, and uh, um, from a regulation standpoint that uh, did not include consideration for uh, the variability, the natural variability that's necessary for wetlands to uh, flourish and wetlands need variability because they need dry periods and they need wet periods. They need dry periods to, uh, to affect uh, vegetative uh, plant life uh, that's positive in terms of the functions of a wetland. And uh, those uh, provisions were not uh, included in the uh, earlier regulation plans. That's why I mentioned Plan 2014 is the first plan that uh, take as it takes into consideration what's necessary to restore uh, some of the wetland damage that has occurred here through uh, the lack of uh, a regulation system that include the variability of uh, fluctuations from season to season that wetlands need to, uh, to be productive. And uh, there is an opportunity to restore uh, wetlands that uh, have been adversely affected by that uh, previous regulation system that was in place. The other upper Great Lakes who are also suffering wetland losses, uh, uh, they can't attribute that to any regulation plans. Uh, and in those cases, for the most part, wetland uh, deterioration has resulted from uh, man actions on the shorelines that have uh, uh, actually converted uh, uh, wetlands uh, to uh, industrial uses have uh, our farmland encroached upon them. So it's actually in physical losses in the upper Great Lakes. And collectively, if you look across the whole system, the assessment is about 60% of the productivity has been lost. So the answer lies for us on Lake Ontario and the St. Lawrence River to benefit the extent we can under the new regulation plan and to ensure that uh, uh, there's not the encroachment on the, uh, the wetlands that I referred to that uh, has taken place in the past. So there is an opportunity to enhance and reduce and return the wetland resources and the coastal areas uh, here in Ontario and the St. Lawrence relative to the new regulation plan. And then the answer with the upper Great Lakes states is to uh, avoid uh, further intrusions that convert uh, wetlands to uh, hard lands again and actually physically uh, uh, remove them from wetland habitat. And that, uh, that's going to take uh, uh, a system of regulations and uh, recognition of the importance of coastal wetlands that I think few people understand that they're really the, uh, the basis of uh, aquatic production uh, that the entire open lake systems and river systems depend upon because that's where really all of the uh, generation of the early plant life and animal life that uh, uh, then uh, um, uh, equate to uh, uh, healthy uh, uh, fish and wildlife uh, utilization of the larger water area that they're associated with. Thank you. Tom, let me, let me tag team on that with you really quickly. So you asked why are wetlands important? I think there's really three reasons. Um, one is they, they store water during flood, during flooding events, during a high water event, a, a water will enter a wetland, the wetland plants and vegetation will absorb that water and slowly release it back into the surrounding watershed. So they, they function like a sponge, so they can, they can prevent flooding. Um, second, they're great for water quality because for the same reason water enters a wetland, it slows down, the sediments drop out, and the plants in the wetland will, will uptake the nutrients and remove them from the water column. And then the third reason, as Tom mentioned, is the, the fish and wildlife benefits. Um, nearly every plant and animal, sorry, nearly every animal in the Great Lakes spends a portion of its life cycle in a wetland. And I think the number is almost three quarters of fish in the Great Lakes spend a portion of their life cycle in wetlands. And then on the scale side, which I think is really interesting, um, there, is about, there are about 64,000 acres of wetlands around Lake Ontario and in the St. Lawrence River. And the new plan, by providing a pulse of water at the right time, 
and removing water, having drier periods occasionally, bringing back that variability. Plan 2014 starts to restore the wetlands around Lake Ontario. And that effort, the 64,000 acres, that's the single largest wetland restoration effort in North America outside of the Everglades. So pretty impressive. So my question almost sounds like it's uh, like a segue from uh, exactly what Tom was talking about. Um, and it's the glass half full question. If we had in 17 and 19 historic high waters that increased the margin in the wetlands, carried those waterborne nutrients further away from the margin of the shore up onto what was, you know, green areas or weeded areas and specifically in our basin. Um, after a period of extreme high and then we have an equal period of extreme low, after having all those water, waterborne nutrients then up on dry land, the next high that we have, isn't it reasonable to think that they'll be less impacted because of the ability of the wetlands to absorb more of that higher water? If the wetlands have, have increased their size, uh, specifically I'm saying like, say the head of grindstone, flints, that margin over 17 and 19, when it withdrew and now you have this dry period that exposed that previously underwater area, wouldn't that be a healthier wetland when the next round of high water comes if we are in fact looking at a, a continuation of high over the long haul? Wouldn't there be a, a net gain from the two periods of high after this period of low? I guess uh, if I'm following the, the reasoning, uh, let me just say that uh, we know from years and years of uh, uh, wetland science uh, and uh, studies of uh, a healthy wetland versus a uh, unhealthy wetland, the key to it is uh, water fluctuation. There's no question about it. I think this refers to your question. You need both uh, wet periods and dry periods for a coastal wetland to flourish. Uh, if it's too dry too long, it becomes invaded by, uh, um, uh, in, in, in our case, around the 60,000 acres of Lake Ontario, St. Lawrence, uh, we've had uh, dry periods that have allowed for the, uh, the vegetation of uh, um, a, a cattail known as uh, typha, that, uh, typha glauca that has uh, taken over um, a lot of the, uh, the coastal wetland that uh, formerly had uh, a mix of, uh, of uh, emergent and submergent uh, vegetative types. And that's what you're looking for in a wetland. Uh, and the importance of the variation of water levels is to have periods of, of high water uh, to help retard uh, some of the vegetation that uh, may be taking over that flourishes under high water but you also need uh, periods of low water for the what, what we call meadow marsh, which is a very productive marsh edge that has uh, um, a, uh, a vegetative uh, uh, requirement uh, for uh, a whole different species of uh, plant life. And it's the variable plant life and the uh, ability of uh, the vari variation of the high and the low that allows for a, um, a productive mix of emergent vegetation and submergent vegetation. So the Plan 14 accommodates this by allowing for a very minor um, uh, variability in water levels of just a few inches during uh, the high and low. And we hope that this over time and the part of the the studies that are going on right now are to uh, evaluate whether or not the new plan 2014 has enough variability of high water and low water periods built into that to give us the variability for both offshore and inshore vegetative types that are required for productive wetland to flourish. And time will tell, and uh, those studies will take a few years, but we hope that uh, the current variability range built into the new plan will accomplish that. If it doesn't, then we're going to have to take another look at that. Uh, but there seems to be a good opportunity for that to uh, 
uh, be successful and only time will tell. But without that variation in water levels, then the entire coastal area will continue to deteriorate. So that's why it's important that we have at least a new plan that is attempting to find out what is the actual range we need. And since it's uh, not a dramatic change, it ought to be, we hope, uh, acceptable for other type uses as well and give the wetlands enough variability of high and low periods to allow the vegetative mix that's important for uh, wetland natural reproduction. Um, you may have implied the answer already in terms of present day, but uh, when was the the uh, canal system and the gateway system on the St. Lawrence River built? And after that happened, was there any noticeable change in lake levels that was not attributed to weather and precipitation? So uh, the, the system began operating in, I think, 1959, 1960. And Drew's going to bring up a slide here that really shows the stabilization of water levels um, based on the previous operating plan for the dam. So an operating plan is basically a system of rules designed when do you hold back water, when do you release water. Um, the previous plan, uh, 1958 DD, I believe was called, uh, did not really consider the environmental benefits or impacts to the lake and river. The new plan tries to accommodate the health of the river system and the health of the lake while still respecting all the other interests that depend on this system. Uh, Drew, do you want to speak to any of this fluctuation? Oh, yeah. Tom, do you want to add anything on that? No, I Did we answer your question? Um, yeah, I, I think so. And, and I was particularly interested in, in Lake Ontario here. Um, so is that, that flat level between about 1960 and present day, uh, is, is that in part due to that system being? Entirely, developed? yeah. You know, if you look at the, this is called a hydrograph. Um, one of my colleagues likes to joke, if you saw this hydrograph, the, the, the 1960 on, I hydrograph, uh, uh, on a, if your loved one was in the hospital and you saw this on the heart meter, you think, oh my God, <laughs> this system is really in trouble. Um, but you can see the stabilization. You can also see the 1930s, the Dust Bowl years. You can see how low the system went. You can see how every 15 years or so, a low level is followed by a high period. That's the variability that Tom's talking about. So there's, there's long-term variability every 10 or 15 years, and then there's variability within a year, too. The spring high, the decline slowly into the, into the winter. Right. So the, uh, it looks like the, the fluctuations in the, you know, the range narrowed down a lot after, after 1959, 58, 59. Um, and I, I believe you were addressing the question, is, is that a good thing or a, or a bad thing in terms of habitat? Well, getting back to the habitat, uh, I think my answer would be, uh, if you look back to uh, the pre-regulation days uh, back in the 30s and the 40s, uh, uh, you'll see a, uh, a much different uh, and more vibrant uh, wetland complex around the entire Lake Ontario and the St. Lawrence River shorelines. Uh, that's when Mother Nature was really uh, um, determining uh, the levels. And those were the days when uh, you went to a, a cattail uh, emergent wetland, uh, you would find uh, a mixed uh, cover type of uh, submergent and emergent, and emergent plants. You would also find uh, thriving populations of uh, muskrats, fur bearer animals that uh, uh, many, many uh, farm ownerships depended upon uh, um, for uh, additional revenue in the wintertime uh, when you had uh, muskrat population flourishing. When the initial regulation plan that went into effect in the, in the mid 50s, uh, that uh, natural variation was lost, and the plan uh, really didn't include uh, variability. And uh, as a result, uh, the wetland uh, uh, vegetative uh, composition changed and moved towards a dominant uh, 
uh, adverse uh, species of uh, cattail, and you no longer saw the, uh, the marshes with muskrat houses and open channels uh, for spawning habitat, uh, for uh, waterfowl nesting uh, uh, sites. Uh, those were all lost as these wetlands became dominated by uh, uh, a species of cattail that I mentioned, type of glauca, that uh, became so thick and dominant that the aquatic life uh, uh, just fell apart. And no longer did you have the variation along the shoreline that provided the, uh, what we call meadow marsh, and that's necessary spawning habitat, for example, for northern pike. And uh, as that uh, uh, meadow marsh uh, along, the, marsh, along the, the edges of the wetlands um, uh, deteriorated, uh, then that uh, fishery began to suffer. And that's continuing right now, uh, and has been, and hopefully we're turning that around with, 20, with Plan 2014. Only time will tell whether the variability, in other words, when, it's, uh, uh, when the water's uh, at the, its average low, the plan calls for just, just a minor change, a couple inches lower, which allows for more dry out and change restoration of the meadow marsh plant life. And likewise, uh, when the water level is up, is it up enough by just a couple of inches uh, to uh, retard some of the invasive cattail species that are dominating the wetlands? So what the new plan is calling for is that variability during the, the high ranges and the low ranges of the natural fluctuation of the lake and the river. And hopefully it, uh, we'll, we'll see, in fact, we are beginning to see right now with some of the studies uh, in Western New York uh, of uh, uh, the University of Brockport that's showing uh, some rejuvenation in this meadow marsh plant zone just as a result of some of the fluctuation that we've been seeing over the last uh, few years since the establishment of the new regulation plant. I mean, that's kind of a long answer, but I don't know if I answered your question or not. Yeah, well, I, I guess time will tell. I mean, we need a little, another 10 years or so maybe to see how effective that is, but. That's right, and that's you. what we're looking at, and that's what needs to be evaluated. Thank you. Put it this way, okay? While we're waiting for that, I'll just say um, the Northern Pike is a great illustrator the story of the northern pike uh, to tell tom's story a little better um sorry not tell it better but uh, uh, sorry augment your story Thank you. I, I didn't i didn't mean that uh the the low water is what creates the meadow marsh community the high water is what knocks back the cattails so the low water periods the spawn the the, the northern pike likes to spawn in the meadow marsh but if the water when the water's low the northern pike can't get up to the meadow marsh. So the low water creates this, the meadow marsh community. The northern pike during the high water period gets in and spawns at it. So those rhythms of high and low water are really essential. The northern pike really, I think, illustrates that well. Is that, is that? So, and thank you. Uh, just a slightly different topic. Uh, it's more about your models. Um, we've, talk, we've discussed environmental variability, et cetera, but the datum is also variable, and it has not been updated, I think, since 1985. Uh, could you just maybe tell us, or, or maybe what type of calibrations maybe that you have to use to adapt your models for the fact that it's a little bit perhaps outdated? Yeah, sure, thanks for that question. Um, so just so everyone knows what we're talking about, I'm pretty sure most people know that what we're referencing here is these water surface elevations are referenced to um, a common datum uh, that's pretty much at the outline of the St. Lawrence Seaway, basically sea level. But because the land surface around the Great Lakes is slowly rising through this process of isostatic adjustment, you know, the glaciers melted away about 15,000 years ago, and when they did, the land started to slowly rise, but did so unevenly. So what that means is all these gauges around the Great Lakes are kind of rotating relative to one another. So Every, every couple of decades, you have to make adjustments to make sure that that's accounted for. So that's all the basis. That's, that's the reason you asked your question. Right. The answer to your question uh, is, I was going to say I don't know, but that's not very helpful. What, um, I can't speak on NOAA's behalf because I don't work for them anymore. But when I was there, just to, you know, before I came to the university, 
um, they were in the midst of a campaign to create the new IGLD 2025, I think, and they were doing measurements all around the Great Lakes through a targeted campaign um, in bays and estuaries on a seasonal basis to make sure they had that adjustment right. Okay. In terms of the models we use, I'm not being as cautious or careful as we probably could be. Um, although when we do our projections, uh, I would say this, we probably don't need to account for it as much because we start with a level and we project a level forward. Um, okay. But this historical data will need to be updated soon. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You bet. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Grunwald, uh, I, I, I've, I've got about 1,500 questions, actually. Uh, but perfect slide to start from. Uh, notwithstanding the stabilization uh, components, were you able to backtrack any of the transitional trends from the 1860s through 1960 to any other continental scale or global scale events, let's say? Um, so by trade, I'm a geologist. so. I, all the work I do is below ground, not you know, and, and usually very deep underground. But so that was one of the questions I had, and then coupled that with the modeling in part there, um, has there been any uh, models updated with the with the particulate matter that's been uh, accelerated in our atmosphere due to wildfires, coal mine fires around the world, on and on and on. I could I could keep rambling, but I'll stop there. Yeah, what a great question. Um, I'm going to disappoint you again probably with the answer, which is that our research really has not. Um, there, are, there are legacy hydrologists in the Great Lakes who did a lot of that research prior to the 1950s. Um, our, research, our research group has extended this water balance record for some of the components either back to 1950 or back to 1900. But that 1900 to 1950 window, we don't have nearly the same data to back it up. So just as a brief note to that, the late 1940s was this huge surge in federal um, support for meteorological monitoring, right? So that's when we get all these air temperature measurements. Before then, there's a lot of uncertainty. So that's that pre-1950 portion. It would be great to do like a paleo study and, and start looking back at these water levels and at attribute water level changes to much broader patterns. There are some folks in the basin who have done that. I have not. And, but more people should be doing it, because that's the stuff they do in Africa, right? They look back, you know, thousands and thousands of years. And then in terms of your air particulate stuff, we haven't done research on that, and we probably should. Great question. No. Nope. I would like to thank everybody for coming tonight, and I'd also like to thank our panel and, and Drew Grunwald. Uh, I hope as you leave tonight, you're a little bit wiser on the drivers of the water levels. Uh, if you have any follow-up questions, feel free to email them to me at Save the River, and we will try to get answers to you. Thank you again for coming. Have a good evening. <laughs>